So welcome, I'm Ken Willie from KOW Building Consultants. This is week four. Um, I actually am going to be doing um, commercial construction foundations and structures today, uh, as opposed to the residential renovations, because I looked at it a little more on the schedule, and I think this makes a lot more sense for people. Um, so if you came on hoping to hear about residential renos, I promise you that will be next week, and that'll be a really good one. I've actually added a lot of good photos, some good stories. Um, so let's talk about today. Uh, today's is entitled Commercial Construction Foundations and Structures. Uh, I could not in an hour cover everything that there is to cover about foundations and structures. So what I'd like to do is give some broad brush strokes for what we see and hear and, and what happens in our industry, particularly in New York City and, and urban and, and older city areas that have older structures and improvements to consider, and what the different types of foundations and structures we deal with and we encounter. <clears throat> now, when I say that, um, I always like to think about what's my goal for my webinar and who is my ideal audience. I, I try to make it so it's one size fits all, but that's not exactly a, a great way to approach it. But here is my goal for today's seminar. If you are a person who is perhaps very experienced and seasoned, maybe I hit on a point or two that you think, oh, I, I didn't know that's what they were talking about when I heard that, or well, I didn't know that's why they did that. Maybe fill in a gap or two. Um, if you're a mid-level experienced person, then maybe I can hope to connect some dots and put together some things you've heard, some terminology. We all know construction has its own vocabulary. Put some pieces together. And then if you're newer in your career, you're actually who I like to talk to the best because I think that it's a very difficult thing to come into this industry and just get out there and start doing whatever it is we're doing in any role of construction, renovations, lending, tax credit syndication, et cetera, without having a good knowledge of what it is we're talking about. Um, do you have to know what an auger bid is or what underpinning is to underwrite a deal from a tax credit syndicator? No, that's why I hire consultants, thank you. But it really does help you to know the process better. It helps you to manage your consultants. And we all know um, knowledge is power, particularly today, where we're a lot of homebound and there's just so much information at our fingertips. So my goal today is to take any person in the audience, drop them on any construction site, mostly in, in an urban type, ground up, large structure setting, and they'll at least know what they're looking at. They'll know what it is, they'll know what's been done, they'll know what the next step is. They could speak intelligently about cast in place concrete versus precast concrete for skeletal steel. They'll know what the, those things mean in 45 minutes. So let's get started. So that's me. Um, so first, a couple of notes. And by the way, like I've said in the past few weeks, every one of these webinars stands alone. If you missed all the ones before this, you're just fine. I, every one is its own webinar. I'm not building one on the other. But I will say one thing that I've said in all of them, and that is every one of these seminars or webinars as they are now has come out of a client request. And every time I've done these seminars, I've tweaked them and I've tried to improve them based on my audience feedback. So a couple of things that I'm gonna hit up right now in the beginning, I found a lot of confusion for my clients and I'm hoping to demystify that a little. <clears throat> so first let's talk about structural engineering. How do buildings go together structurally? And by the way, don't worry, there's lots and lots of photos coming. I know people like photos. There's lots of photos coming, I promise. How do buildings go together structurally? Well, let's break that down a little. Uh, first of all, you of course know that you're going to hear a lot out in the field, on the phone with developers, contractors, architects, whatever, all about loads, 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 loads. There's different kinds of loads, all of which our building has to consider. There's a live load, like me, a desk, a dog, um, my computer, live loads, moving loads. Not temporary loads, but moving around loads. It's a live load. If I weigh 100 pounds or 300 pounds or 800 pounds, or we look at an elevator and we see that it's eight people, 2,500 pounds, the live load is that moving load. 
as opposed to what? Dead load. That's our concrete. That's our steel. That stuff's not going anywhere once we install it in the building. Structural engineers, of course, are gonna take all of these loads into account when they design buildings. Live is one of them. Dead is another. Seismic's another. Some area of the country, seismic or earthquake loads are very serious. Some in New York are still considered. Yes, we do consider New York City to include seismic provisions. Other areas, they don't have to worry about that as much. Wind load. Okay, this one I think makes obvious sense. You want to build down in the Keys or in Miami, you're going to have a much different wind load than you are in, say, central New York or somewhere where you're not right off the coast. Wind load. Snow load. We obviously know what that is. We're going to be designing for that. Vibration load. What's that? I don't know, maybe there's an elevated um, subway line that runs right in front of my building and it is shakes my building every time it goes by. Vibration loads. Maybe it's a subway that's underground. <clears throat> so when we look at all these loads, think about the direction we're gonna consider and you'll start to see buildings differently. Live load, dead load, snow load. They're going from top to bottom because of gravity. That makes sense. So when you see things supported from below, we're taking these gravity loads and sometimes they're lumped in as called gravity loads. What about a wind load? Well, that's coming at the side. It's not exactly top to bottom. What about vibration or seismic load? That's side to side as well. Well, in that case, we're gonna have things like cross bracing or a shear wall. There's a word that you're gonna hear out there. What's a shear wall? Why do I need it? So if you wanna put things into a box, number one, gravity load, number two, side to side load. And then the question is, well, are there uploads? Yeah, there could be. If you have a pitched roof and that wind hits that sucker and, and starts to pull that, wants to pull the roof off of a building, take a look at any pictures after a bad hurricane and you'll see that roofs get pulled off of buildings because they hit and they just try to lift that roof off the building. That's an upload. Now that's gonna come into play in, for example, areas that have to consider that will nail their joists uh, to their studs differently than where they don't have to consider. So the bottom line is we have to consider uploads, downloads, across loads, side to side loads. Now you don't have to consider this unless you're watching this as a structural engineer, but these are all taken into consideration. So we'll design with safety factors to bring the load to the earth. That's the bottom line with structural work bring the load to the earth safely. That's what we wanna do. So we build our building envelope first. We wanna build our jacket, not the sweater yet, the jacket, the envelope. Stop the elements, stop the water, stop the moisture, et cetera. So if we've done that, if we can consider our load, which is all those different pieces, we've designed to bring the load to the earth, and we're stopping the elements, the building envelope, we're about 90% there. I mean, we've just done a lot to help this building safety and longevity. But let's start to take a look a little bit at what these things are. So this right here is a picture of a skeletal steel building. We're gonna get into more detail on that in a minute. And skeletal steel means it looks like a skeleton, which is bones, meaning you could see that they kind of look like bones and they're supporting the structure that's gonna then go on top of it. What's that thing I circled there? Why does that go across the building? Well, if you think about all the members that go up and down or side to side, they're working in unison for our gravity loads. That cross member is for our seismic or wind load. That's the side to side load. The reason I jump right in with this is because if you, are a geek like me and you sit back and look at buildings being built, you say, why are they doing that? And if you didn't know anything about structures and you looked at this building, you'd say, well, I know why they're building it up and down and side to side. They want to install the floors and the windows and the brick and everything else. But why do they have those side to side pieces, that cross bracing? That's why. It's to take up that load. And I'll also give some advice. If anyone out there builds anything if you're a weekend warrior, you build anything in your house, you build a trestle, you build a table, you build a storage, anything that is up and down and side to side as a structure, and it's wobbling more than you want, throw a couple of cross braces in and watch how quickly the physics works for you and it'll stop it wobbling. So just to dive in 
I hope if you look at that now, you say, oh, I, I know why they did that. That's for that side to side row. Okay, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. And again, I promise you, we got lots of photos today. Let's get through some of the, we'll eat our vegetables, then we'll eat our cookies. There's two foundation types we're talking about, two, deep and shallow. Let's talk about deep first. So a deep foundation, and I'm gonna show you pictures in a minute, has long slender members. Think of a telephone pole, properly called a utility pole. Put that in your mind, that is part of a deep foundation system. We put these things into the earth, usually drive them or drill them down, and driven piles, a pile driver is like hitting a nail. Drilling them like a caisson is like screwing a screw. Then on that long slender member, we put a pile cap, which is like a hat to go on a few different piles, say four or five. Then on that, we build up, we either do a mat slab, I'm gonna to get to in a second, or grade beam. And then on top of that, we build our building. Again, I'm gonna show you photos here in a second. So deep foundation. Okay, so if you picture a piece of land and you picture that you excavated or dug down for your cellar, and then you started driving these telephone poles down as far as you could. Why do I do that? Why am I doing a deep foundation system? Well, you're doing it for a few reasons. If you have a high water table, so there's water underneath everywhere, how high it is or close to the surface is the water table's answer. If it's a high water table, it's not that far from the surface. And guess what happens when we build stuff through that water table? We could get a hydrostatic or an up pressure. Now you should remember when we talked about loads earlier, that's one of the uploads, high water table. Didn't seem possible, how could I have an upload? Gravity moves down, not so fast. Sometimes it does move up like a water table. Number two is if I have a heavy building, and this relates to size of the footprint. So for example, um, in 2006, I think it was, there was a type of building that you started to see explode all over New York City, which you didn't see before that. And it's unique to New York City, and it's a slender or a slim building. The reason is that was the point where the rents and the for sale unit cost for condos hit the point of being now economically viable. So that big building on that small footprint is considered a heavy building. It's going to have a pile system or a deep foundation system. And just to kind of put in your head a heavy building versus a light building, imagine if you have a piece of land you're gonna build on and on the, the building site is, let's just say 50 feet by 50 feet. If you build a two-story office, you built two stories on 50 by 50. If you built a 10-story apartment building, you built on the same 50 by 50, five times as many floors. So that would be kind of getting into that heavy building in relation to the footprint or the earth that it touches. Number three, if we have unsuitable soils. Again, that's kind of related to heavy building as far as the capacity of the soil to withstand our load. High liquefaction factor, what is that? Jello. Jello has a high liquefaction factor. So does sand. If you knock into it, it shakes like hell. Not good during an earthquake. So that is something that we've decided, let's, let's take this a safe way and say, if this is gonna have a real sandy strata and we have an earthquake, let's put piles in, let's do a deep foundation system. Obviously, if you go to, for example, California, they know all about this. And if you look at the actual age of the buildings, years ago, we used to build buildings in seismic areas to allow them to move. We wanted that and we allowed a threshold. Then we changed in this country and in California said, you know what, let's build it as rigid as possible. Forget plastic, I want, I want a steel concept. I don't want this sucker moving at all. That doesn't work as well. So we're back now, we know that we're gonna have some movement. We're back to kind of the old school, liquefaction factor, it's going to move some. So what do we do? Deep foundation system. And then the last one will be vibrations. 
I have a subway across the street, which is elevated, that may be a need for a deep foundation system. Well, if that's a deep foundation system, what's a shallow foundation system? Shallow foundation is a little easier. It's not heavy compared to this site. The suitable soils are there to support my building. I don't have a water table issue. Think single family home. You have a footing and a foundation wall. So if footings are the skis, foundation walls are the ski boots. And just think of this concept. If you're standing in the snow in ski boots, you sink down. Put skis under your feet and you're technically a little heavier because now you have skis, but you don't sink down. And everyone understands that concept. Everyone understands it. Everyone's had, when they were a kid, this, why, why do we have such a weird fear growing up of quicksand? You would see in these TV shows back in like the 80s, everyone would get caught in quicksand. What do you do? You spread your body out. Same concept. We're spreading the load out over a larger area. So we build a footing, let's say for a single family home, 24 inches wide. And then on top of it, we put the wall, let's say 12 inches wide. We're spreading the load out. You might put a footing drain and waterproofing, but that would be the structure to support that shallow foundation system. When you have a shallow foundation system, and we're gonna show you some pictures in a moment, you'll have a cellar slab, which is not structural. It's just there, the structure is supported by the walls. So let me show you some photos. So this is some photos of pile foundations, deep foundations. Now, either one of those pictures shows you the same thing, which is long, slender members, either driven to hard strata, bedrock, were driven and used with a what's called a friction resistance. And a friction resistance would be take your fingers, stick them into mud, let them settle, and then pull them out fast. And it's actually quite hard because the mud moves around your fingers and now there's friction there, which you don't like it that it's harder to put your hand out, but if your hand was your pile system, it fortifies your building. Long slender members, we put a pile cap and a column. And by the way, the same concept of ski boot and skis applies here with the column and the pile cap. But those piles are just gonna help us a little more with our load. Here's what it looks like when the building is done. We have our piles, we have our raft or slab or whatever it is that's spreading the load to those piles, and then we have the building. So that's kind of a schematic of what we're going after. Well, what does it look like in the field? Well, the unfortunate thing is that's what it looks like in the field. Now that is a pile. That is a telephone pole. That has been driven down. You're not seeing 28 feet of it. You're seeing two feet of it. Do I know there's 28 feet below? Not really, but there's a company there that's driving these things like crazy. And what they're gonna do at the end is get the top to a certain height, put in that cap, and then they can build on top. So when piles are done, you just see the top of the pile. So for this picture, those piles are done. They've been driven down. And anytime you walk by a construction site and you hear that, it's like, dip, 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 dip. that's a pile driver. It's also an excellent wrestling move. Pile driver hits that pile. And when the pile resists, less than an inch movement over 25 hits, it's quote unquote strong enough. So there is a factor of, yeah, I've confirmed that this pile is loaded properly. There are different ways to do it, but that's most common. Now, can we have piles that are steel? Yep. Concrete, sure. Steel filled with concrete, uh-huh. We could do geo piers, which is a stone pile. We drop a casing or think of it like a sleeve, we auger out or pull out the earth and we compact stone behind it. But the same concept applies no matter what the material is, if it's a pile, long, slender, that's the point. So what you're gonna see here is the next step would be to install concrete on these caps and gray beams to now distribute the load to those piles and now we're starting to see something to support our building. It's starting to look more like a structure of a building. This is a two-way footing or 
You can see here in the middle, there is a pile. You can see that we're installing these gray beams around. So it's starting to take a shape of a building. Okay, well, that is what a deep system looks like. What does a shallow system look like? So again, my ideal viewer out there, if you drop into a site, I want you to be able to look at this and say what I'm about to tell you about what we're looking at. So this would be a shallow foundation system. This was probably a two or three story townhouse style building. We do a lot of those, that's my guess, but I don't know. You see that steel, that rebar, or which is reinforcing bar. And then you see the forms or the wood on each side and below. Well, actually there's no wood below. So what is what are we looking at here? We're looking at a concrete footing. Let's say it's 24 inches wide, I don't know, but let's guess that. Which has got everything ready to go except concrete. So here's your before picture. There's your after picture. Now, this one has a different rebar scheme, but the point is we put the rebar or the steel in the concrete, and then we pour the concrete in. Now it's starting to resemble a footing where we can now build upon our foundation walls. And I would go as a side note, because this is kind of an important one. Sometimes people say, well, why do I have to put steel? Concrete is very strong. Yes and no. Concrete, which just to kind of take a step back for those of you that have not worked with concrete, it basically has a consistency of oatmeal. And there's not a lot to concrete. There's sand, you know what sand is. There's rock, you know what rock is. There's water, so far so good. And there's Portland cement. The Portland cement and the water have a chemical reaction. They harden through an exothermic or releasing heat reaction. And the sand and the stone go along for the ride. And they get locked like hand solo and carbonite. And then you've got concrete. So if it mixes like oatmeal, and you make your oatmeal bowl and you put it down, this is when we were going to offices, and you run out to work and you forget to clean up your oatmeal, you come back at the end of the day, what happened? What happened is you could peel your oatmeal out of your bowl. It's sort of what happens with concrete. We pour it like oatmeal, there's a chemical reaction, it's not a chemical reaction with oatmeal, or not the oatmeal I eat, and what happens is as that hardens, it solidifies and it locks that steel into place. And here's why we need the steel. Concrete is very strong in compression, pushing, like standing on top of concrete. Steel, long steel members, are very strong in tension or pulling apart. But where one of them has a fault, where concrete is poor in tension, pulling apart, and long pieces of steel are poor in compression, meaning pushing them together, they work in unison. So the steel, goes in the concrete to it, enable it to have a greater strength against that tension or that pulling apart. You might not envision concrete pulling apart, but if you're standing on something and it's bowing, meaning going in like a little bit of a U, then that means the bottom part is actually pulling apart. So that's why we have steel in concrete. Here's a picture of concrete footing. Okay, so if we have a deep system, we have a shallow system, now what? We've, we figured out how to transfer our load to the earth. All right, we're gonna build foundation walls. So this site, for example, they formed up and poured foundation walls. Anytime you hear the word form, just think it's a temporary holder. It's all form work is. Form work temporarily holds that oatmeal, like your bowl in your house or your apartment, until you come back from work. You don't need the bowl anymore when you get back from work. You can peel that oatmeal right out. That's what form work is. It holds that concrete in place until it's cured to the proper strength that we can remove the form work. So we'll form up, we'll do our rebar, we'll get our approvals, we'll pour concrete. Now you're looking at foundation walls. And by the way, if you're wondering, well, that foundation wall looks like it's about 12 inches wide, I'm guessing there's a footing below that's about 24 inches wide. Exactly right. Here's a concrete foundation. On one side is gonna be our building, on the other is gonna be the earth that it's going to keep back. And now we're building up in air. Good milestone. Here's another job. 
they're getting ready to, uh, that doesn't look very scientific, but they're forming up the wall there on the left. They're then gonna put the rebar and then they're gonna pour their concrete. So wall's not formed and, and poured yet, but that's that stage that this wall is at. This wall, the far side is poured. So you can see this is gonna be some, looks like it's gonna be a townhouse style as well. There's your form work, not ready for concrete. We don't need the concrete truck yet, but we're getting there. Okay, well, what about an older building? What about a pre-World War II, which stay tuned next week. I have a great webinar next week on old school pre-war um, buildings. Rubble, stone, foundation. You hear that a lot. Pre-World War II buildings, rubble, stone, foundation. So this is before we were pouring concrete foundations. We poured, or sorry, we installed stone with a grout or glue foundation wall. So when you walk in that cellar and you look and see this, you say, aha, that's a rubble stone foundation. Yes, it is. Rubble stone foundation wall. You can see the stone kind of characteristics of it. And you're right. It's literally rock with some glue. In this case, we got brick above, but the foundation wall is rubble stone. This is usually what the rubble stone looks like. Now, this doesn't look very scientific, but if you think about it, it's doing exactly what a footing and a foundation wall does. It's taking the load from the house or the building, which is 12 inches wide, and by the time you get to the bottom of that wall, it's spread it out over a greater area. This is doing the precise thing that a footing and a foundation does. Spread the load over a greater area. That's what it looks like side view. Okay, we got our footings or our piles, we've got our foundation. Now what? Okay, well now you need to build your building. You're you're out of the out of the ground, which is a great milestone. You got your foundation walls. What kind of building do you want? Let's go through the different options. First of all, you could have a masonry building. There are three types of masonry. That's it. That's all you need to remember. Three types. Cast quarried and baked. Cast is poured like your oatmeal. CMU or what's called cinder blocks, not actually cinder anymore, but it's okay. Cinder blocks, precast concrete, uh, a block and plank job, precast concrete plank, cast, poured, same thing. You set your bowl, you pour your oatmeal in, you leave it. Cast, poured, number one. Number two, quarried. Mine, pretty straightforward. Go into the mountainside, get your marble or stone, you got your stuff. That's another element of masonry. Similar to cast, but very different. Mother Nature made that, not us. And then baked, like clay, terracotta, tiles. So you're baking it in the oven. So all three types of masonry, although they, they had a different origin story, to use a superhero term, they ended up being the same concept of similar makeup of materials and gonna be used in a similar way in my building. So I have my masonry pieces, whatever I'm doing, and then I have my glue. Mortar is my glue. And I'm gonna show you some pictures in a second. Most CMU walls are gonna be four inches, eight inches, 12 inches, but here's the cleverness of this. Thank you to builders from many years ago, it includes the mortar bed. It includes the glue, which means dimensionally, it's a lot easier to figure out how much I'm gonna need or what the level or height's gonna be if the mortar is included in that block. We're gonna talk about cavity wall systems, which are preferred. And what's the big thing about masonry? Well, be careful about cold weather. You got water in your mortar. You got water in your cast concrete. Cold water, I mean, cold weather, water, bad. Now there's some things you can do. You can have like a, an additive or a winter mix, change order, or you know some old school concrete suppliers, guys driving those trucks would have bags of sugar under their seats in their concrete truck. And if they got stuck in traffic, they'd hop in the back and they would just throw the sugar bags back in the 
the rolling cylinder for the concrete truck because it was a retarder. It would slow the, the casting down or the um, curing down of that concrete. We don't want them to do that anymore because it affects, you know, it's, it's, it's changing the recipe and then baking the cookies and wondering why they didn't come out right. Concrete's a fairly precise thing to make. We're talking about big time structural work. We don't really want them messing with the recipe. So here's what's most often we see on jobs. Now, as much as this gets, um, I don't say confusing, but it's a couple key elements. If you take them away, it's really what you need to build on. So this is CMU, concrete masonry unit. This is concrete, but it's not made at the site. That's the key. It's made in a warehouse somewhere and it's brought to the site and we put it together like Legos. Big fan of Legos. The nice thing with these is, with those pieces, you can make anything you want because the pieces will grow to build walls or floors or st structures, whatever you want. <clears throat> the reason there's two holes in them is two reasons. Number one, it takes away volume, which means it's cheaper and lighter without giving up a lot of structural integrity, still a very strong shape, the one we see most often as a CMU piece. The other thing it does is it allows you to put it over the steel that goes up and down, and then I can fill that entire void with grout, which, if you remember a few slides ago, is the same element of concrete. The steel working with the grout and concrete work together to bind that wall to give you what's similarly like a reinforced concrete wall. Although it looks a lot different, it's the same basic effect. You also have in older buildings, of course, brick, a lot of brick. Brick we usually don't use as structural members today. These old buildings did. If three would have been enough brick wide or brick whites to support, they may put five or six, but you see a lot of old brick on buildings, structurals inside. Brick is actually a baked item. It's, it's made that way uh, then, now, you name it, but it's obviously a big, big item with existing buildings. We also see brick as a masonry item, exteriors, different types of exteriors. We've got a nice stone header above our window, lintels below our window. And by the way, anytime you hear the word header or lintel, think window. Why do you need a header or lintel? Well, your window in glass is not very strong. The load above it is gonna crush your window. So to keep that from happening, we're gonna to have to put something structural above that. In this case, it's a nice decorative stone. It could also be a piece of steel or lintel. So this looks like a nice older building. This is a, a, a good photo I like because and I know I totally geek out on this, but you guys do too. Don't tell me you don't. I know you do. If you look at this and you stand there and study it for a second, you can see a fingerprint of an old building. You can see at the rear where the old building that was next to that building ended. You can see where its roof line was. You can even see some windows and some pockets that were filled in that had joists. So if I were working on the site where this building used to be, I would say to my client intelligently, hey, I'm looking to see maybe a four or five story building that was here that was removed at some point. So you see that fingerprint, you see that echo of our old building in our building next door. Another thing that's worthy to mention now is, actually no, I wanna move on to metals. I wanna move on to metals. Okay, so masonry, we cast it, we bake it, we quarry it, we have pieces, we build whatever our building is. It's a block and plank building. I'm gonna show you pictures in a second. It's a brick building. All right, what other alternatives? I don't want masonry. I don't like masonry, I want metals. All right, you want metals, that's fine. So when we talk about metals, um, you know, metals made in, you know, a warehouse. It's a very hot, environment, melted iron and carbon, coke and limestone. Uh, you know, any, go to any good like movie that takes place in Pittsburgh or Ohio, you see the old mill and there, there's, you know, like in Rudy and his friend dies, unfortunately, and, you know, 
you're making steel and you're you're using high temperatures and when it cools we can do all sorts of different things great strength cast iron wrought iron alloys different shapes um corrugated decking we can make all different types of very good very strong fire rated wonderful wonderful properties for steel to build buildings here's just a nice little shot of a steel lolly column or a column which goes to a plate and then a concrete footing below and if that plate now looks to you like a footing bingo exactly right it's spreading the load out and it's picking up that steel girder above there's a load path there and that's how we're bringing it to the earth most of the time steel what's a w or an s member usually call it i beam it's not actually an i beam but that's okay these guys come to site ready to be installed see all these holes the flanges the length the, this is an erector set this comes to the site ready to go up in place it's ready to look like that now if you step back and say wait a minute what am i looking at here well you know what you're looking at you got a concrete slab down there you got cmu or concrete masonry walls with structural steel is that allowed of course you're allowed to do it what they're going to probably do and, and i know this building so most of the building is going to be cmu and plank but the first floor if you want longer spans higher ceilings it could be easier to do steel you don't have to do only one way you don't have to do two or three ways but that is how you should look at this now the different elements of steel and cmu here's an installed piece it's an i-beam why do we use that i-beam shape well an i-beam shape as opposed to if it were all just solid steel takes away a lot of volume between the top and the bottom uh, flange. It takes away a lot of volume, which is weight and cost, but it doesn't give up a lot of structural integrity. It's a very, very efficient shape. It's a great shape. So here we're looking at structural steel, supporting corrugated decking above, and then probably a concrete infill floor on top of that. Here's steel being erected. Again, steel erection, structural steel or skeletal steel that's this building that's the stage of construction these can go up pretty fast because they come to the site ready to go you put these plates between them you put your bolt and your nut and you're you're good to go here's another picture structural steel you also see our rebar and our concrete from our foundation below this is a great picture actually because we see at the top of the picture, structural steel. We're starting to see our non-load bearing metal framing go in, the top two floors, actually all floors. And then look down below there, we're starting to see our sheathing or our skin of our building and our windows go in. So it's starting to resemble a finished product. So if I drop you on site and said, what are you looking at? You should say, this is a structural steel building and it looks like they have metal stud framing inside. Excellent. What if I want to build a concrete building? We talked about masonry. We talked about steel. So concrete and masonry can work in unison. You're looking at a block and plank job. Anytime you hear block and plank, this is what you should think of. Block is the CMU, the Lego pieces that we're building our walls. And plank is a poured concrete piece that's made somewhere else in a warehouse. It comes to site, usually four inches wide, hollow core, meaning they've got holes in them, they're hollowed out to keep good strength, but take away volume, cost, and weight. And it's dropped into place on the load-bearing CMU walls, and then we build our next wall, drop our next floor, build our next wall, drop our next floor. So block and plank, think big, long pieces of floor, going on CMU built walls. And now the last one, poured in place concrete. Well, if you remember, we poured our footing in place. We poured our foundation in place. We put up our forms, your bowl of your oatmeal. 
we did our rebar and we poured our concrete. What if I want to build a building and pour it in place concrete? Can I do that? Absolutely. It's a fantastic, wonderful, strong, hardy, good, good for any heights. Concrete is a great structure to pour in place and build. It's more expensive than block and plank. It's, uh, and you need to have a good qualified sub. But what you do is you form up on the sides, you form up for below. Now this is new. When I poured my footing before, the earth was my form. Now I'm gonna have to form up from below to keep my concrete. Let's say this is the third floor you're looking at. I need to keep the concrete from flowing down to the second floor. So I'll actually form from below. I'll put my rebar or my reinforcing steel. I'll pour my concrete and then I'll repeat the process. Now a project like this, and again, it could be different ways, but in this job, poured in place concrete columns, poured in place concrete floor system. That's all you need to know, fully concrete building. And what usually gets done, don't have to, but what usually gets done is, let's say I'm looking here at the third floor, to the left and right are the second floor columns, because if you can imagine, they go down to the second floor. What you usually do is you pour those second floor columns with the third floor because you pour those columns of concrete and then as it overflows you're up to your third floor there's also a, a structural reason why but the point is you'll pour those columns with the floor above as you go so if you're thinking well, wait a minute all that wood is temporary yes and is going to have to support a lot of weight meaning the concrete until it strengthens yes and it's going to look like this now when you actually have the forms, it's going to look like this. So below this is going to be structural support. After the structural engineer comes in, say after a couple of weeks or something, and we've done you know a seven-day test and they're they're happy, they'll remove this wood, but they'll keep these form in just to keep some of the load off the concrete until it cures. So every one of those pieces you see there is temporary. When that concrete above strengthens fully it's good to go but it's just temporary to keep it in place to cure or dry or strengthen until we're ready to remove it but it's the same concept as a footing form rebar pour strengthen all right what about wood framing or what about framing itself so is wood structural does it support the low the floors that it could it could be bearing, load bearing, or non-bearing. Um, when we talk about framing, we've got wood, we've got metal. What's the difference? Oh, wood's cheaper, wood's quicker. Metal is a much better fire rate. So in many instances, got to do metal. From a fire rate standpoint, got to do metal. But not always. And usually you see 16 inches on center is our stud. Why is that? Well, that's because our sheetrock and our plywood are sold in two feet by four feet pieces. So uh, sorry, um, four feet by eight feet pieces or four by 12. So it lines up well with a partition. Let's look at some photos. Here is a wood frame building. You should notice we got a nice looking poured concrete foundation. The cellar below that obviously is going to be a garage. And now we're doing wood framing. We put our studs up, we build our next floor, and we move on. Obviously, wood is a bit limited, although. There's some places and countries that are doing some amazing things with taller buildings with wood, but wood is a bit more limited than metal as far as strength, rigidity, and fire rating. Here's another look. Now, what are these things up, up top here and below? They don't look like wood, but they look like wood. You know, if you're building any kind of wood structure now and you're not incorporating some sort of engineered wood truss or laminated wood element, you're missing out. Because this stuff now, these engineered wood, it looks like an I-beam, but it's wood. Very strong. Really good stuff. Good spans. You need less material. You can build it quicker. And you've got nice spans for the homeowner or whoever the end user is. Here's our metal studs. Doing the same thing as wood. Allowing me to build my walls up. What are all these holes in the walls? What are these notch outs? Well, They've done that at the manufacturer knowing we're gonna to have to run 
cable and electric or plumbing or whatever it is through the walls. So it's doing the same thing as a wood stud, it's just a different material with different characteristics. What about an old school building? Those don't have sheetrock on studs. They don't. They have plaster and lath. So what happens is nowadays we have sheetrock. You can buy in pieces. It's a gypsum based product. Nice, easy, clean way to go from the 60s on. It's been the way to build walls, to cover your walls. Back in the day, the plaster and lath, these wood laths or pieces were put in place as a substrate just to hold the plaster that was then applied, which looks like that. That is a wall, that's the lath, the wood, of which the plaster is gonna go on top. So let's say you're looking at a building that's gonna be rental, you walk in, this is what you see, you know that's an older type of construction, at least pre-60s, and on top of that lath will be a plaster that will be applied like a slurry, think of it like um, maybe chocolate syrup, maybe a little, little thicker, and like Hershey chocolate syrup, the only kind. And as you apply it, it hardens or dries, and then you've got a wall. So that's in your older buildings, not in, in our newer buildings. Um, not a repair you could, but you wouldn't do with a new construction necessarily. All right, so we talked about footings and foundations. We talked about the different types of structures, CMU, steel, wood, cord and place concrete. So you walk up to a building and you, you want to know, what am I looking at here? This is, this is, say, a completed building. What, what am I looking at? Well, ask yourself these questions. Number one, how are the elements stopped? What's the, what's the raincoat? How is water kept out? And we never stop water. We manage water. I mean, we've done buildings that have had permanent pumps in for the longevity of the building because it is a high water table. You're just, you're never solving that. Although I will say a quick story. We did the inspection of Electric Lighting Land Studios a few years ago in New York City. And I go downstairs, which by the way, as a guitar player, seeing the Electric Lighting Land, I was out of my mind excited. I go down in the basement in the cellar and they have pumps going because they have such a high water table. And I looked at our old map, the Veeley map from 150 years ago. I saw that there's underground streams right there, which are very prevalent in New York City and Manhattan. And I researched it and I found when they built out that space, Jimi Hendrix commenting how there were delays and overruns due to the dewatering. And I'm like, that's it. Jimi Hendrix commented on dewatering. I could die a happy man. Okay, so how are the elements stopped? Raincoat. How is the coat supported? Meaning what's the structure of it? What's the thermal or air barrier? Now that's the sweater. How am I kept warm in or warm out or cold in? or cooled out? How is the drainage handled? What is the internal or interior thermal barrier? How are the windows and penetrations drained? And what is the facade to roofing relationship? So when I look at a building, and I've never been in it before, this is kind of what goes to my head. How am I stopping the elements, stopping the air or the air infiltration? How am I keeping hot air where I want, cold air where I want? And what's the relationship between the side of the building and the roof? So let's look at a few examples. The best brick type of masonry you could do is a cavity wall. And if you look at that schematic on the right there, you'll see there's the brick, which is stopping that rain. But you notice there's an air layer or an air white between the brick and that brown. That's an air white. That's a gap of an inch or whatever it is per spec of air because it's saying that we know we're gonna allow water in. Brick will wick water in and it'll get in. Wind-driven rains, it's amazing what storms can do. So a cavity wall says, okay, we're gonna tie the brick to the makeup or the structural wall on the inside. Could be steel, could be CMU, you guys all know that now. But that air white, that air layer, when the water hits it, it will fall down because of natural gravity, it has nothing else to do, it'll fall down. It'll hit a flashing or a little spot where the water will then come out. So the takeaway here, when you hear cavity wall system, think this, wall can get in, but we're gonna drain it out. Here's a mock-up or an example on a project of a 
cavity wall system. So if you will, the water could hit that brick, go behind, hit that black barrier you see there, we see BA, fall down and then come out that stainless steel, that gray flashing. There's actually holes there called weep holes. That's what a cavity wall system does. There's also systems that are not cavity wall systems. They're just veneer systems or the brick is just up against the makeup. So I'm gonna look and say, is this a cavity wall system or is this a veneer system? Is this a brick structural system? Meaning there's three or four layers of brick that are the entire structure fighting the elements and on the inside. Another thing I'm always gonna look at is what kind of replacement have they done? This is a building that we can see, you know, most often on your roof and on your side or on your elevations, you have problems where you're doing stuff, where you've punctured holes in the walls, like windows or AC, through wall AC sleeves, or in roofs where you've punctured holes like stacks and drains, that's where you're gonna have issues. Not in the field usually, it's usually in the puncture. So you can see here, the different colored brick, they've done replacement. Where have they done it? Above windows. I just went to a building not that long ago, fairly new building. They had a lot of this stuff above windows. And the guy said, I don't know what's going on. I said, I can tell you what I'm guessing is going on. You got a 15 year old building. You shouldn't be replacing brick above your windows. So what probably happened is, when you were building this building of a cavity wall system, you had so many mortar drops or mortar sloppily got dropped into that cavity uh, between the brick and the makeup wall that it clogged up your weep holes. The water's getting in, now it can't get out. So let's look at that. When we go, why do we have brick replaced at all these spots? And it just so happens it's along the windows. There's not, that's not just a coincidence. We'll look at, here's an example of a brick wall. There's a relieving angle or a structure to support the brick. Brownstone is another type of facade. Again, we're talking about different facade types. Brownstone was a very popular facade type. Believe it or not, it was actually a cheaper alternative when a lot of it was built. A lot of it was built in Harlem and in Manhattan for high-end single-family homes with a single family inside and then usually servants or maids or whoever's quarters downstairs. High-end, good quality of construction and uh, you know brownstone. A lot of it was brought down the Hudson River from Maine. Great, beautiful material, can be restored. Um, and that's, you know, we, we see a lot of this still. So that's brownstone. Here's a, an example of a great looking kind of ornamental. You know, I'm not a big fan of just broad brushing. Well, they don't make it like they used to. Well, they don't make this like they used to. This is some pretty magnificent stuff. A lot of stuff, you know, it looks beautiful today. It was done by hand, masonry work. Now, you know, we can get into uh, the different elements of this, but again, the same kind of concept, that masonry stopping the elements. We've got our windows and hopefully caulking and ways to keep the elements out. And then on the inside, we'll see, you know, usually on your older buildings, you're not gonna be well as well insulated as new buildings. Perhaps it had a renovation, but here's an ornamental masonry building. That's what I'd call that. All right, what about a modern building? This would be usually called a, and again, I'm hoping you could just step in front of the building and go, I think I know what I'm looking, no, I know what I'm looking at here. Curtain wall system, glass curtain wall. Well, what does that mean? Glass, we know why glass, because the majority of this is glass, and it's a beautiful part of the city skyline. Curtain wall, why do we call it a curtain wall? Well, we call it a curtain wall because it's not structural, it's just hanging on your building and it's keeping the elements out, like a curtain. Whereas if you look at that old tenement building that has brick as the structural support that you see on the outside and the inside, that's not a curtain wall, that's a structural wall. This is a curtain wall, which makes sense because we're not gonna have glass be a, um, you know, be a structural element. So if I were to show anyone this and go, what's my structural type? What's supporting this building? You should be able to say, well, I don't see any concrete here. Um, these are too thin for that. I don't see any CMU. I'm gonna guess it's it's probably steel. You'd probably be right. Now with, with saying that, there could be concrete columns just out of view. I don't know. But you could start to put pieces together. 
start to eliminate things and whittle down what kind of a building am I looking at. So that's a glass curtain wall. Here's another type system, aluminum or paneled system. We can see we've got some waterproofing and insulation with these channels and then aluminum or panel system goes on. Another facade type. Cedar shake siding. A lot of the jobs we do out east in the Hamptons and such is the requirement. Got to do it. What is it? It's wood. It's wood. Now, you could have a vinyl or a impression of this, um, but you also could have wood as, for example, cedar would be the most common. Vinyl siding. Everyone knows, I think, what that is. That's vinyl is the material. Cheap, long-lasting, um, easy to fit to different sizes. Used to have a real kind of negative connotation. It's come a long way. It's come a really long way. Great product. You could have a cementitious covering, like a, a thorough coating on your existing building. You could have stucco. You could have ephus. Stucco is, is hard and rock-like. Synthetic stucco or ephus is soft. It's, it's got a rigid insulation and then covering. So there's a few telltale signs. You go knock on it hard, got stucco. Sounds hollow, you got ephus. Exterior insulated finish system. They're similar but different. A lot of people lump them into the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're similar but different. Hardy plank. Great product. It's a manufactured and engineered product. Great resiliency, great installation, looks dynamite, fights the elements, great stuff. You know, some of the issues we see, cracks, step cracks. There's been some settlement here. This was not supported properly. That's a structural crack. That's a tear. That's like someone ripping a piece of paper. But we gotta look into that, there's a problem. Ah, we got a big problem. That what supported this above, uh, below has failed. And then the biggest one of all, parapet walls. Parapet wall has the roof on one side, the sky on the top, and the elevation, the, the earth, uh, uh, the front or the rear, whatever, on the side. Parapets are fighting the elements from three sides. They're gonna go before most everything else. They're getting hit with rain and sleet, snow, hot, cold. They're gonna, they're gonna be your element that's probably gonna leak first, your power of the wall. Like this. And that tar material, no good. It, it, it will invariably leak, water gets behind, and then you're gonna have accelerated deterioration. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please send them over on chat. I got a question here. Uh, what is the best type of facade system? Uh, good question. It depends. Um, if you look at your old buildings, their bones are usually very good. They're structurally sound. They can have another 150 years of life. I'm a big fan of old world craftsmanship, absolutely 100%. But if you look at your newer buildings, you're gonna have a great thermal efficiency. You can do all sorts of things with HVAC and lighting and windows. So your flexibility is gonna be a lot less, a lot better. I'm not one to just say replace it and scrap it. Uh, I don't think that's the right way to go. So I guess either one, um, you know, it depends on kind of use and, and end user. Any comments on helical piles? We're seeing more of these. Yes, thank you. Very good question, Gory. So um, to, to put it in context, we have a nail and we have a screw. A nail is a driven pile, like that um, telephone pole that we just bang like hell. A screw is like a helical pile, it's screwed in. I don't think you will see driven piles in New York City for much longer. I think they'll be a complete thing of the past. Reason is, when you drive that pile, there is a vibra vibration load. It does impact the surrounding area, which means, in an area, an urban area like New York City, where we've got a lot of buildings a lot closer than other areas, you could have some ill effects to the neighboring buildings. Whereas a helical pile, just like you can screw something in very slowly or you're not using that force, that impact is a lot more gentle. Boston has done away with driven piles. It's all caissons and drilled or auger piles up there. 
it's almost the same here in New York City. And I think that it's just a matter of time because it's just too uh, intrusive to neighboring buildings and other structures. So I think we're just about at time. Uh, oh, hold on, I got another question. How does later added stucco impact the intended permeability of the original brick wall? Yeah, good question. So um, if, if you have a brick wall and you cover it with a thorough coating, that actually will be a good application. It'll keep the elements out, but it will breathe. Whereas the original generation of EFIS systems were flawed. The current generation of EFIS, to use a corollary, are good. And the reason they were flawed is because of exactly what Gory just asked. That the original EFIS systems, you'd have an exterior rigid insulation, then you put your finished system on top. They would be too um, unyielding. Water would get behind, and now it can't get out. And now that it can't get out, it would uh, use, usually contribute to mold and deterioration above windows and openings because the water's trapped. So what did the EFIS uh, people do? There's now a drainage plane worked into that. So a proper application like a thorough coating is fine on brick, but you don't want to cover brick and think you're never going to have problems. I had a, a, this slide here, actually. Um, here, this black stuff at the bottom of the page is a big problem. It is a tar-like material. It's not actually tar. And what people do all over the place is they use it as a waterproofer. You got a crack, you cover it. Here's the problem. When you use that stuff, it will invariably leak. And once it does, water gets behind, water freezes, expands, and can't escape. And it will actually accelerate deterioration of your brick. You're suffocating your brick. So I'd say a proper application like a thorough coat, good. An application like this, this is really not an application we, we recommend. In fact, when we ever see this on a parapet or a bulkhead, we always recommend it, it be removed and replaced with a proper masonry coating. All right, I think we hit about our time. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everyone watching. Share the link. We'll be here next Wednesday at one o'clock. And one last thing, next Wednesday, a lot of really good photos, a lot of really good tips about good old school residential renovation projects, what to look for whether it's tubs in the kitchen, gas meters in the kitchen, or dumb waiters, I'm gonna cover a lot of really good photos of what's weird, unique, and different about that residential reno project versus a new construction job. So that's it, thank you for watching. I appreciate everyone. Stay safe, see you down the road.